glad you're here, especially on a uh, holiday weekend. Thankful that you could be with us. I uh, just want to say just a quick word about next week. Uh, every, uh, every year on the Sunday after Labor Day, we host uh, what we call Back to Church Sunday. The idea is all of us know people uh, that have fallen out of the habit, you know, over the summer months, and we just need a mulligan. Uh, maybe you're, you're one of those people, if you're like me, you need a lot of mulligans when you play golf uh, and in life. So we're going to offer people a mulligan. You should have found a, a good, uh, a nice invite card in your bulletin. Just use that this week. Uh, give it to somebody. We'll be kicking off a, a new series we're calling Unchained. And the idea behind it, a lot of people are carrying around, you know, some pretty heavy regrets. So we're going to talk about how you move beyond some of that and experience sort of a, a fresh start in your life. So, so this week, be praying about that. We're going to put some stuff up online that you can share on your social media. Also, some of our leaders are going to be making some calls. So you might get a phone call. And if you get a phone call, let that be a prompt for you to, to call somebody else and invite them to church uh, next week. Now, this morning, we're finishing up the four chair series. And I want to start with a question. You don't have to answer. Just think about it. What was your favorite game to play when you were a kid? All right. Uh, I don't know. There's something about these games. Doesn't matter if you were born in like 1850 or 1950 or 2005. Uh, there's certain games that everybody knows how to play. Games like uh, Duck, Duck, Goose, uh, Hide and Seek, uh, Musical Chairs. Uh, musical Chairs is one of those games. Nobody really knows uh, where it came from, but over the years, it's been pretty popular, and the rules have pretty much stayed the same. You have this, this group of chairs. You have one less chair than the number of people you have. Somebody starts the music, you walk in a circle, the music stops, everybody grabs a chair, and then the person left standing is out. And then, you know, you take another chair out, and you go around the circle until you have one person left. How many of you have ever played a game of musical chairs? Just raise your hand. The rest of you are not telling the truth. Just, yeah, all right, everybody's played this game. Um, did you know that you can actually become a professional musical chairs player. Did you know that? I didn't know that till this week. I looked it up. Uh, if you always wanted to be like a professional athlete and you never made it in anything else, this might be your opportunity. You can be a professional musical chairs player. Back in 2012, there was a guy named Fred Smith who came with the idea of starting a professional musical chairs league. And believe it or not, he was able to to raise the money, and in June of 2012, he started what's known today as the World Musical Chairs Federation. Their first tournament was held in Amesbury, Massachusetts, was called the Musical Chairs, Musical Chairs World Championship. And just so you don't think I'm making this up, I've got a picture I want to show you. Uh, the very first tournament, over 1,200 people showed up and registered to compete to become the world champion of musical chairs. With that many people, as you can imagine, they divided it up into four different games, each starting with 300 people. They then narrowed it down to the top 60 and put them in the finals and kept going it down. They, believe it or not, ESPN actually sent a reporter and covered this, and they talked about how as the, as the numbers got smaller, as it went from 1,200 to 300 to 60, then to the, the final few people, the intensity level went way up. And one of the things they discovered is that they did not have enough referees. Uh, now, you wouldn't think you'd need a whole lot of referees in musical chairs. They said they had people getting cuts and scrapes and people uh, being sent to the emergency room because of the intensity of this musical chairs game. According to ESPN, the final six competitors included a retired school teacher in his mid-60s, a 230-pound former professional football player, a mom of twins in her early 40s. Is Anita here? I saw her earlier. Just Anita, just keep that in mind. Um, a 23-year-old grad student and a 31-year-old investment manager and a retired Marine. Altogether, the competition took seven hours and included over 1,000 song snippets. The champion turned out to be a 31-year-old guy named Mike Sagowski. I've got a picture of him. Uh, you can barely see him. He's standing in the winner's circle. For his prize, he was given a padded folding chair that says world champion and a check uh, for $10,000. Uh, but he said none of that compared to the title of being called world champion. 
After he won, he was being interviewed by ESPN, and he said two things that I thought were interesting. First, the reporter asked him what he did to prepare for the event. And here's what he said. He said, as an investment manager, I sat down a lot. Really, I've been setting pretty much my whole life, so I guess I'm good at it. <laughs> you, have to, you have to kind of admire his honesty. The other thing, a little more helpful, the reporter asked him, what was the key to achieving this victory? Now, I don't know, you know, what they expected him to say. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of, you know, strategy involved in musical chairs. But here, here was his response. He said, as long as the music is playing, you have to keep moving. You think about that, I guess that's true. I mean, if you're playing musical chairs, the only thing that can really mess you up is if you, is if you stop moving. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about these four different chairs. Chair number one, the chair we labeled Seek. That's people who are trying to figure this out. Uh, they've got some questions. They're trying to figure out where, what they believe and where they fit into all this. Chair number two is the chair where you've made a decision. Now you're, you're growing in that decision. You're allowing Christ to transform you. Chair number three is where you transition into serving other people. It's no longer about your own personal growth. Now you're trying to help other people grow. And then chair number four, the, the chair we talked about last week, a lot of people never make it. That's the chair where you're still serving, you're still growing, but now you're also leading. You're trying to help other people uh, become servants and leaders. You're trying to develop uh, this movement. And the idea is throughout all of this that is as you grow, as you continue to follow Jesus, there should be some significant progress in your life. There should be some, some evidence that you're continuing to move to, to new levels. That's a, there's an expectation of that. David read earlier Hebrews chapter 6. Here's what the Bible says. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Now, if you're a parent, uh, part of your desire for your kids is that they would, you know, they don't repeat the same grade over and over again. If they're in elementary school, you eventually want to see them, you know, get to middle school. If they're in middle school, you want to see them get to high school. If they're in high school, you want to see them, you know, get out of the house kind of thing. There's this expectation that you want to see your kids grow. The same thing is true when it comes to your spiritual life. The problem is, though, for a lot of us, it's like the, the music is still playing, there's still some chairs that are open, and we've just sort of stopped making any progress. If you have your Bible with you or your phone, I want you to go to Mark chapter 4. This morning, we're going to look at a story, very familiar. You've probably read it dozens of times. It's one of the few stories that's actually in three of the four Gospels, which means the early followers of Jesus thought this was a story that was really important for you and I to understand. And to set this up for you, it's kind of a repeat of what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Jesus is next to the Sea of Galilee, which is where he hung out a lot. He's doing some teaching, and this huge crowd of people have surrounded him. People have, have never experienced anything like Jesus. They're trying to get close to him, and the crowd has become so large that it's, it's pushing him into the water. So he gets into Peter's boat. They set off from the shore just a little bit so he can talk back to the people that are landing on the shore. And as he launches into his sermon, he tells them this story, a story that, that all of them could relate to because they lived in a very agricultural society. Everything, you know, everybody understood the process of planting seeds and harvesting a crop. So Jesus oftentimes returns to that well whenever he's got something he wants to teach a crowd of people. I want you to look at what he tells them. Mark chapter 4, verse 3. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, you read this story, a lot of different things you can focus on. You can focus on the, the sower. There's this guy who thinks his job is just to, to plant as many seeds as possible. You can focus on the, the seed itself, which you'll learn later is, is the word of God and, and planting itself in people's hearts. But I, I think as you read this, Jesus himself puts the emphasis on the, these different types of, of soil. 
He says there's four different types of soil. Some of the seed lands on hard soil. It can't penetrate the ground, so the birds swoop in and take it. Some of it lands on shallow soil, so it, it springs up quickly, but there's no root system. And some of it, some of it lands on, on soil where it grows, but there's, there's so many weeds that the weeds come in and choke out, the, choke out the plants and it overtakes them. In fact, if you look this closely, Jesus said there's only one type of soil that produces a crop. Make sure you understand it. Jesus says only, only one-fourth of the seeds you plant are ever going to produce a crop. Now, that explains a lot when you think about it. There are going to be people that you'll probably invite this week who may not come. There are going to be people that you may, you may spend your life trying to reach them, trying to, to invite them to experience what you've experienced, and they may not be interested. There are going to be people that you're going to see that are going to make a good start when it comes to their spiritual life, but then something's going to happen, and they're just going to slowly drift away because Jesus says at the best, I mean, the best, best case scenario, one-fourth of the seeds you plant are ever going to produce a harvest. Now, that's the bad news, but there is some good news. Look at what he says again in verse 8. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. I don't know if you're a person who uh, invests money, but financial planners will tell you, if you can get a 7% return on your investment over a long period of time, that, that's really good. And every once in a while, you know, you open up the paper and you read about some stock that goes crazy and a bunch of people become millionaires, but that's not normal. Um, I read this week, if you had purchased one share of Coca-Cola in 1919, when they first went on sale, if you had purchased one share, it would have cost you $40. If you held on to that share from 1919 till today, uh, that one share would be worth $394,352. If you'd reinvested the dividends from that over the years, that one share would be worth over $9.8 million. I mean, don't you wish you'd go back and talk to like your great-grandpa and say, all I'm asking for is one share. Can you imagine what that would be today? I mean, that's what most of us dream about. But compare that to the return on investment that Jesus talks about. He says there are certain seeds, they're going to produce a crop, some 30 times, some 60, or even 100 times. He's talking about this, this principle of multiplication. That's what we talked about some last week. So if you're keeping track on your outline, here's, here's the goal. Here's what we should be striving for. It's multiplied impact. That's what we've been called to. That's what we've been... Uh, that's what Jesus has, has called us to do. That's our mission. Now, just imagine if you got to the end of your life and you took out a piece of paper, could you write down a list of 30 names of people that you had impacted for Jesus? Could you do that? Or what about 60? Or what about 100 names? Could you, you think it's possible that when you get to the end of your life, you could list 100 names of people that you'd help connect with Jesus. Sad reality is very few people ever experience that. Very few people ever get that kind of return on their investment. But there's some reasons we don't. And what we're going to see as we go through this parable is Jesus is going to explain to us uh, some reasons why we don't experience that kind of multiplication in our life. One of the cool things about this parable in particular is that after the crowd goes home that day, it's just Jesus and his 12 disciples and some other people, and they're hanging around. The 12 disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, we heard that story you told earlier. Now, will you explain it to us? Now, a lot of these parables you read, it's just kind of up to you to make sense of it, but Jesus actually goes through phrase by phrase, and he explains exactly what he was talking about. Check out verse 10. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be seen but never perceiving or ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then you get to verse 13, and Jesus actually begins to explain the story. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? So what he's going to do in these next few verses is talk about 
the three major barriers that keep us from experiencing this multiplied impact, the things that, that keep us from experiencing what it is that Jesus has called us to do with our lives. And it works the same, whether you're in chair number one trying to get to chair two or you're in chair two trying to get to three or three trying to get to four, the same three things keep coming up over and over again, sometimes to different degrees, but it's the same, it's the same three things. So if you're keeping track on your outline, here's the first thing Jesus says. If you want to have a multiplied impact, you're going to have to maintain an open heart. Look at what he says in verse 14. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So here's this picture. Here's this farmer. He's reaching into his bag. He's grabbing these handfuls of seeds. He's just throwing them everywhere. He's not worried about where they land. He's just throwing it everywhere. And some of it lands on these, these paths where people have been walking and the soil is really hard. In fact, it's so hard that the seed cannot penetrate the soil. It just lays on top of it so that the birds swoop in and, and take the seed. And Jesus says, that's a picture of how Satan operates. Jesus made it clear there are people whose hearts over time become so hardened that it's almost impossible for the word of God to break through. It's a picture of somebody who maybe um, grew up going to church, you know. They went to Sunday school. Uh, they went to, you know, VBS and all that stuff. And they know all the songs, man. They know, you know, deep and wide and all the motions and all that. They can tell you all the stories. But over time, they've continually said no to God. They've continually turned away from God. They've, they've, they've turned away from God's truth and come up with their own truth. They've, uh, they've turned away from, from, from God's call or life and tried to do their own thing. Uh, maybe they've rejected God's standards and come up with their own standards. And what happens is every time you do that, every time you say no to God, every time you say no to God's word, your heart gets a little bit harder. Some of you have experienced that. Some of you know people right now, maybe in your family, that are experiencing that. No matter what happens to them, nothing seems to penetrate. They hear a message, just bounces off. They experience a tragedy, and rather than turning towards God, they turn further away from God. They don't even entertain the possibility that God might be speaking to them. I think the same thing happens to some Christians. I think there are some of us who, who, you know, we believe in Jesus, we, we show up at church, but the reality is we're just sort of closed off to whatever God might be trying to do. I want to I show you a picture. I saw this this week. Um, according to what I read, this is the world's best recliner. Now, I can't prove that to you, but that, that's what they tell me. It's also one of the most expensive. Uh, it's called the, this, check this out. This is the name of this chair. The Human Touch Zero G 4.0 immersion seating massage chair. The basic model is just over $5,000. So if you want me to you know, hook you up with that, be glad to help you do that. According to the website, here, here's what this chair can do. It can give you a full body massage, has Bluetooth capabilities in case, you know, if you don't want to use the remote for the chair, you can operate this chair through your phone, has four different cup holders, uh, a built-in heater for those cold nights, built-in charging ports for all of your devices, even has what they called a base shaker for when you're watching a movie and you want to feel like you know, you're, you're in the movie. And this is an amazing chair. The problem is with a chair like this, it's so amazing and so comfortable, you never want to get out of it. You know what I mean? You, your whole life just becomes sitting in that chair. And I think for a lot of people, that's a pretty good picture of their spiritual life. They're, they're at a certain point, they're in a certain chair, and it's become so comfortable, and they're so used to it, that the idea that God will call them to move this direction or that direction, or that God might call them to do anything different, uh, just they're not interested in that. They're, they're closed off to all. They're so used to, to saying no to everything that God calls them to do. So it, it's like this, you know, they, they want to go to a church that there has a lot of kids as long as somebody else is teaching them. They want to go to a church uh, that's building a new building and renovating their campus as long as nobody asks them to, to give sacrificially. 
they might even agree that they want to go to a church that reaches lost people. They just don't want to have to do anything or change anything or accept anything. A lot of people like that. And all the while, it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit is standing behind in the chair and he's whispering there, hey, there's something for you to do here. There's a job for you. There's a role for you. There, there's a mission that you can accomplish. There's, there's more that you can experience. And from time to time, they even hear that. I mean, they hear that whisper, but they've gotten so used to saying no that it's almost as if God has stopped talking to them because their hearts are so closed. Truth is, if you want to experience God's best, you have to learn to... To listen. Well, check out verse 20. Look at what Jesus says. He said, Others like seed sown on good soil, they hear the word, they accept it, and they produce a crop. Now, the first step there is hearing the word. And in Greek, it's not just you hear the sounds, it's that you listen, you, you respond to what you're hearing. What that means is if you really want to have a long term impact, or the people around you, if you want to have this multiplied impact, you have to listen and respond when God calls you to move. You have to maintain an open heart. Here's the second thing. If you want to have a long-term impact, you have to continually deepen your roots. Some of the seed fell on hard soil, and some of the seed falls on shallow soil. Look at what Jesus says in verse 16. Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So there are people, you know, they make an emotional decision. They go to a weekend retreat. They go to a church camp. You know, they have this moment, and for a while, they're, they're all in the great enthusiasm. They get baptized. They join a church. They, you know, start a ministry. They volunteer. And for a few days, you know, maybe for a few weeks, maybe even for a few months, maybe a year or two, they're all in. But then, but then something, something happens. And, and what happens is that, is that life happens because life is hard. And Jesus says there's going to be trouble and there's going to be persecution that comes. And, and you know that because you've experienced it. It always comes. It comes from different directions. It comes in different shapes and sizes. Sometimes it's a bad report from a doctor. Sometimes it's an unexpected tragedy. You know, somebody you love passes away. One of your kids is injured in a car wreck. You come home one day and your spouse is gone. You go in the next day. Your boss calls you and says, we don't need you anymore. Bankruptcies, hospital stays, deaths, bad grades, business failures, moral failures, accidents, bad decisions, bad habits, addictions, broken hearts, uncertain futures, all of that stuff happens. And for a lot of people, it's those unexpected challenges that uproot their faith. And here's what happens. Something bad happens. You, you experience some trouble. You, you experience a little persecution and you get a little bit down. You know what I mean? You're not as excited as you were. You get a little bit down. Then you get a little bit discouraged. Then you start to drift. Then you drift far enough and you get disillusioned. And then you get disillusioned to the point that you just stop. It's kind of like a big tree. You might have a tree in your yard, you know, from the ground up, man, it's big and it's full and it's alive, but if the roots aren't very deep, a storm comes through, what happens? It blows that tree over because there's no roots. So what do you do? Apostle Paul said it like this, Colossians 2. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted in and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. You continue to build your roots. You continue to dig down deeper and deeper. John 15, Jesus said it like this. Harden read it, first, read it for us earlier. Here's what he said. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know what the key word there is? Remain. No matter what happens to you, no matter what happens around you, no matter who disappoints you, how much you disappoint yourself, no matter who turns their back on you, no matter how deep the wounds are, no matter how big your questions are, you learn to remain. Your translation may say abide. You learn to, to stay connected because that's the only way you're ever going to make it. And if you do that over time, if you just make the decision, no matter what happens, I'm going to remain committed. If you do that, the return on your investment is unbelievable. 
One more thing. Jesus says, if you want to be fruitful, you're going to have to routinely eliminate distractions. This may be the one that most of us here struggle with the most. This is a type of heart that all of us battle against. Check out verse 18. Here's what Jesus said. Still others like seed sown among thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. You and I live in a world now that's completely and totally filled with distractions. You know that we have to constantly battle against this. Jesus names three different categories. First, he says, there's the worries of this life, and you know what they are. I mean, in the back of your mind, you may have a list right now of things that you're worried about. Unfinished projects, um, relationship problems, unpaid bills, uh, unfinished homework. I mean, there's no, no, no end. Or maybe it's not just stuff you're worried about, it's stuff you're involved in, stuff that you're, you're overcommitted to. Maybe you're trying to do too much and you're going from here to there and here and you're just out of breath and you're exhausted all the time. I love what Bob Goff, he's a writer, said, he said this, you should write this down. He said, it's easy to confuse a lot of activity with a purposeful life. Think that's true? I know you're busy. I know I'm busy. We all got stuff to do. A lot of us have more to do than we can reasonably get done. But here's the question. I know we're doing a lot of stuff, but are you doing it stuff on purpose? You have a vision for what you're trying to accomplish. For a lot of us, the truth is, God couldn't really use us if he wanted to because we don't have any time. Next he mentions the deceitfulness of wealth talking about you know spending your life you're chasing money it's the next big purchase and you have this number amount in your head you think well if I could just hit that number if I could just pay this off then life would be so much better and what you find is you hit that number you pay that thing off and you find out it's a moving target same thing with what Jesus calls the desires for other things I mean, it's so easy you get distracted by stuff and let's be honest, it could be anything. It could be fantasy football, it could be real football, it could be your job, it could be Little League, it could be social media, it could be Netflix, it could be watching too much news. I mean, it could be any number of things. There's no end to the distractions that are out there. And if you don't know what it is for you, here's what you do. You go home this afternoon, you, you pull out your, your calendar or your schedule, or if you're like me, you keep it on your phone, you open up your, your calendar app, and then you get your checkbook or you get your last credit card statement. And you look at the last 30 days of what you've been doing and where you've been spending your money, and that'll tell you what's distracting you. It's the easiest way in the world. And the truth is, there's a lot of things out there that we have to battle against. And here's why this is so important. Jesus said, if you don't take care of some of that, those distractions grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're like weeds in your flower bed. They grow up, and they just keep taking over everything until even the good stuff gets squeezed out of your life because there's no... There's no room. I love what Tim Keller said when he wrote this. He said, distraction sends more people to hell than doubt ever did. That's true. For some of us, the best thing we could do today would be to go home, start pulling some weeds. Might be hard, might be messy, might be uncomfortable, but in order to get where we want to go, we have to eliminate some weeds. I want you to listen to the way Jesus ends this parable, verse 20. Others like seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some a hundred times what was sown. One of my favorite events every year is the North American Christian Convention. Um, used to be called that. This year it's got a, it's got a new name. And it's in a different city every year. It's this gathering of, of about 5,000, 6,000 ministry leaders from all over the country. Everybody gathers in a different city, and you have these programs, and it's really cool. But one of the things they do uh, during the week, after one, on one of the evenings, after one of the main sessions, they have these, these receptions that are hosted by all of the colleges that are associated with our movement. So there's 10 or 12 of them. So you go down this hallway, and you know, there's Kentucky Christian in this ballroom, and uh, Cincinnati Christian in the next, and Milligan, and Ozark, and uh, Hope International. You have all these different schools. Like I said, there's 10 or 12 of them. 
And uh, if you went to one of those schools, they expect you to show up and you go in and you find the school you went to, you walk in the room and they got a few snacks that are sort of uh, sitting around and then they, they might give you a free t-shirt, you know, and then a donation card, you know. And then if you get there late, the t-shirts are gone, but they got plenty of donation cards. You know what I mean? You know, you know how this works. And there's a few, you know, professors that are hanging around just in case, you, you know, if you, didn't, if you didn't get enough of that while you were in school, you can go, you can go talk to these guys. And the idea is it's a chance for you, you know, to hang out with some people that maybe you went to school with or support your school or reconnect or however you, however you want to phrase that. So I was thinking about that this week, and I thought, I wonder what it would be like if when you die, you go to heaven, right? Hopefully, you go to heaven. And you find this, these rooms, and there's this reception room that's been set up, and it's got, it's got your name on it. And what you're going to do is you're going to host this reception for everybody that you impacted with the gospel throughout your life, everybody that you helped connect with Jesus. So you go in this room, and if you were a nursery worker at your church and you helped some kids experience Jesus, those kids are going to be there. Uh, if you invited your neighbor to service and they came and, and you know, got connected to Jesus, they're going to be there. Anybody you witnessed to, anybody you shared your story with, they're all going to be in this room and you're going to give them a free t-shirt and, you know, there's no donation cards because it's heaven, but, but there's going to be a time for you just to reconnect and, and re, you know, experience and talk about everything that happened in your life with people that you impacted. So I got to think about that. I wonder how many people would be there would there be 30 people there? I mean, on the guest list, would you have a list of, of 30 people that you impacted? What about 60? Do you think there could be 60 people there? What about 100? I think there could be a list of 100 people. Now, it seems to me if you were going to have 100 people show up at your reception in heaven, that you'd have to work pretty hard. But Jesus says, Jesus says that's possible. It's rare, but it's possible. Then I got to thinking about this. If, if Jesus said that only, only one-fourth of the seeds ever produce any sort of harvest, I got to thinking that means that 75% of us, when we go to heaven, then let's say they got this ballroom all set up and it's got our name on it, and we go and there's nobody there. Can you imagine what that would be like? Would there be anything worse than going to a reception and nobody else showing up? Here's the deal. You're going to spend your life doing something. You are. There's no way around it. You can spend your life. You can buy a great recliner. You can kick back. You can watch Netflix till Jesus returns, and you'll be comfortable, but you won't have much of an impact. If you wanted to, you could spend your life chasing money, chasing possessions that you're going to leave behind the moment you slip into eternity. Or if you wanted to, you could spend your life practicing and getting really good at musical chairs. In fact, you might be so good that you can win the world championship and they'll give you a padded chair to take home and a check for $10,000. But when it's over and when the music stops for the last time, only thing that's going to matter is did you know Jesus and did you help anybody else get to know him? I don't know where you are in all this. I don't know which chair you put yourself in. I don't need to know. You need to know. And maybe you already know. And wherever you are, I'm telling you, Jesus is calling you to move up one seat. If you're in chair one, move to chair two. If you're in chair two, move to chair three. If you're in three, move to four. Just don't stop. That's what so many of us did. So if you're here and you need to talk to somebody about what that would look like, to move, you want to pray with somebody, maybe you just want to make this your home, uh, we'd love to have you. Would you stand with me?